Thank you, Andy, and thank you, everybody, for attending today. Uh, once again, I want to thank our partners here in the state of Maine and Tension uh, for making these wonderful masks that we wear throughout our healthcare facilities um, in Northern Light Health. Um, we have some wonderful news that we're going to share in just a bit, but I'd like to get to some of the numbers first. Um, first is that as of this morning, we had 30 uh, total inpatients across our system uh, who are positive for COVID-19. One of those individuals is at A.R. Gould Hospital, 17 at Eastern Maine Medical Center, one at Inland Hospital, nine at Mercy Hospital, and two at Sebastocook Valley Hospital. In addition to that, we are caring for 35 individuals positive for COVID-19 at home through our home care and hospice agencies. Our vaccine numbers as of Tuesday morning, we have administered a total of 17,562 doses, which represents 12,244 first doses and 5,338 second doses. Those doses that include healthcare workers, not only those employed by uh, Northern Light Health, but uh, community healthcare workers, as well as are beginning to start uh, vaccinating people over the age of 70. So right now we're excited to announce that beginning February 2nd, Northern Light Health will begin community vaccinations for those over the age of 70 at the Cross, Ins Cross Insurance Center in Bangor. We started vaccinating those over the age of 70 at various smaller vaccination sites across the state on January 23rd as an interim solution to get vaccines into arms as quickly as possible. Establishing a mass vaccination clinic during a global pandemic is a monumental task that involves considerable resources and collaboration within our system and with the state and local governments. Paul will discuss the staffing in greater detail mo momentarily. As with our previous vaccination clinics, Patients will need to register ahead of time to receive a vaccination appointment. Community members over the age of 70 can currently register either online at covid.northernlighthealth.org slash public vaccine or through our call center hotline 207-204-8551. New appointments are going to be released each Monday and as more vaccine becomes available. We are currently experiencing extremely high volume to both our registration website and call center we thank the community in advance for their patience as we work to get all community members registered for vaccinations in an efficient and effective manner. I am delighted to announce that at 2 p.m. today, we will have a special open session of our vaccine um, scheduling for that, those uh, appointments for next week at the Cross Center. But here's some highlights things need, people need to know when going through the vaccine site. If you register online, please print off your confirmation page and bring it with you if you can. When you arrive, come to our door 10 minutes early and no earlier to avoid long lines outside, especially during the cold winter months. We ask that you wear a mask inside and stay physically distanced, that you dress warmly in case there is a wait, that you will feel a pinch when you are getting vaccinated, but it is nothing more than that. You'll have to stay 15 or 30 minutes after your vaccination, so please plan to wait. You will need to continue to wear your mask and follow physical distancing protocols, wash your hands, staying socially distant, and avoiding congregate settings uh, just as you have been doing. We must do this for others who are still waiting to be vaccinated and because it takes uh, two weeks before your second dose to build up immunity. With many things we've experienced during this pandemic, this effort is truly a first for hospitals and healthcare providers, including Northern Light Health. With any initiative of this size and scope, there will be bumps on the road, but so far we have been successful. We hope that in the future when the COVID-19 vaccine is commonly given and as easy to get as the flu shot, we'll be able to offer them in the office. And last but not least, the Maine CDC has recently warned about a phone scam for vaccine appointments or contact tracing where the caller will ask people for social security numbers. This is a scam. Neither the CDC nor any of our hospitals will ever ask you for your social security number by calling you. I just wanna quickly go over things that people want to have uh, in front of them when they get registered to, for vaccination. First, make sure you have your information ready. Be sure that you have your insurance card or, Medicaid or Medicare information, your phone number, and an emergency contact ready to complete the registration process. At this time, you may be asked to input your social security number depending on your insurance. That is okay, that's not part of the scam. Uh, today at two o'clock, you can start registering online or via our phone system. But most weeks, it will simply be Mondays at 2 o'clock when new appointments are added. The only reason why we're doing it special this week is because we have this great news about the Cross Center. Please make sure that you get a confirmation email, and if so, print it out to bring it with you. 
If you need help, find a trusted family member or friend who can help you through the registration process. And if you can't register online, call our, our number. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul for some news about staffing. Thanks, Dr. Jarvis. And to put some uh, scale around some of the comments Dr. Jarvis made in terms of available vaccine and interest from the community, uh, this past week uh, we had approximately 3,000 doses uh, and appointments available for those uh, 70 and older. Um, and we had uh, 26,000 uh, email uh, inquiries and 15,000 phone calls. And so the, the demand for vaccine certainly greatly out, outnumbers uh, the amount of vaccine doses that we have. Vaccine quantity is the limiting factor here. And so um, we continue to work very hard uh, with our community partners uh, to ensure that vaccine is put into arms as soon uh, as we receive it. Uh, and we've done a very good job uh, with that. But it's important to make sure that uh, you continue to have patience um, as uh, we are uh, administering vaccine uh, as soon as we are able uh, when we receive it. Um, in terms of volunteering, we've had a wonderful outpouring from community members interested in volunteering to, to help, help us support this effort in the community uh, vaccination program. And uh, while we certainly expect uh, to have a need uh, for community, large numbers of community volunteers down the road in the coming weeks and months, uh, we know that as we upscale uh, the Cross Center, um, we uh, plan to, to do that with our own internal staff and our existing volunteer group right now uh, to make sure that we have a smooth process rolled out so that when we have uh, the need for uh, more vaccination clinics uh, during more times during the week, um, we'll have a more uh, uh, a process uh, streamline uh, to allow that uh, additional community member vo volunteerism. So again, um, we certainly welcome volunteers and uh, uh, just want to make sure that we have the, the notice that for now, we are able to staff the clinic next week with the volunteers and staff that we currently have, but we will be providing more information in the future um, so those opportunities will become available and we'll share those with you at that time. Thank you, Paul. We have one more bit of housekeeping before we take questions. There's been a lot of misinformation circulating in social media channels about the, M the messenger RNA vaccines and how they've developed and how they, they work to help fight COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Gass, lead physician of infectious disease care, and Brian McCullough, primary clinical manager, a pharmacy clinical manager, uh, both of Northern Light Eastern Maine Medical Center, explain how the vaccine works and dispel some myths using analogy of a cookie recipe. Uh, that video is available on YouTube, and we can share it with you via Dropbox if you're interested. And with that, we'll turn it over for questions. Thanks, Dr. Jarvis. Um, as I mentioned earlier, everyone will have an opportunity to ask two questions. I'll unmute you, uh, call on you, and then when you're unmuted, uh, you should be ready to roll. And so we'll start with David Horowitz, TV7. You should be good to go, David. Can you hear us? David, we'll come back to you in a little bit and try again. Um, next up is Mary Kate from uh, WMTW. Hi, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, hopefully you can hear me all right. We can hear you if fine, Mary Kate. Ask... Oh, great. Thank you so much for your time. If I may ask, what would be your message to seniors who, uh, after Monday's appointments were pickly, quickly picked up, uh, who are still sort of wondering where they fall and, and maybe feeling a little bit frustrated and, and out of the loop here for getting an appointment. So first, we apologize for any inconvenience anyone has had. Um, as Paul stated, uh, we were overwhelmed by the number of individuals who want vaccine, and that's good news. We want people to want the vaccine. We just need to get the vaccine to give it to them. Um, and unfortunately, we are hampered by the limited supply. Uh, this news about the Cross Center is welcomed news. It will allow Northern Light Health to request more vaccine because we'll be able to administer it in a more quickly, safe, and effective manner. And so we're hoping that that will happen. Um, we're delighted also by the recent news from the, both the Biden administration and the Mills administration about the uh, opportunity to have more vaccine delivered to the state of Maine. Um, our message is be patient. Your time is coming. 
We will get to everyone, but it is going to take time. Um, when we continue to talk about that, we will be vaccinating through the spring into summer and, and possibly into fall. Those are real numbers. And so people just need to be patient. Um, the, the governor and her staff have, have highlighted that people over the age of, 17, of 70 are our priority right now. And it is the priority of Northern Light Health to assist in any way we can to reach out to, to people that are over the age of 70 and get them vaccinated. Thank you for that. And if I may ask a follow up, and you sort of just touched on this, but creating a mass vaccination site is a way to get more vaccine. I know you've mentioned the supply being a big pinch point here. That is correct. So part of the way the federal government has been allocating vaccine is by usage of that vaccine. So they don't want to have vaccine uh, sitting around in a freezer someplace not being used. And so as we use it, that allows us to ask for more vaccine. Um, and this will allow us to be as efficient as possible in getting that vaccine into people's arms. All right. Thanks, Dr. Jarvis. Thanks, Mary Kate. Um, next up is WABI Allegra. You should be unmuted now. Hi there. Um, just a quick question about uh, the second dose of the vaccine. Um, how will people go about uh, signing up for those uh, appointments? Is it the same as they would have for the first? Um, I know just with the volume, um, how should people go about going for that second so that's a, great, that's a great question, Allegra. You know, how do people get scheduled for the second dose? We actually do that automatically as you, as you schedule for the first dose. You are automatically scheduled for the proper clinic time for that second dose, depending on whether you're receiving Pfizer or Moderna. And that's one of the reasons why we set up the process that we did. And I know people say the process is complex, but it's actually built for your safety. Um, in order to make sure that one, you are getting the vaccine that we had said you were going to get, and two, that you are scheduled for that second one. I also want to highlight that if you are scheduled for an appointment, then we have vaccine for you. There is no worry that while you're, while you're waiting to get vaccine on your dedicated day that we will run out or anything like that. We only schedule appointments for, indivi for individuals when we have a vaccine dose for them. So I want people to be, feel reassured that once they have that scheduled appointment, there is a vaccine waiting for them. Great. Thank you. That was the only question I had. Well, thank you. Um, David from TV7 was having some issues with his mic, and he, um, he messaged me his question. So I'll read that to you, Dr. Jarvis. He asks, outside of quarantining, what are the most important things you can do when you test positive for COVID? So quarantine is, just, is, is one of the most important things you can do to limit the spread to any other individual. But the other thing is you need to take care of yourself. So that means monitoring yourself uh, and reaching out to your healthcare provider if you're having difficulty breathing, if you're unable to keep fluids down, or if you just genuinely feel unwell. There are remedies that we can take for people who have mild to moderate disease to help prevent them from getting in, into more distress. And certainly anybody with severe disease, we want them to be evaluated. So uh, definitely quarantine is important to keep the spread from other individuals, uh, but you also wanna take care of yourself. And that means uh, everybody within that household should be wearing a mask during the time that somebody is quarantined within their household uh, just to limit the spread within their household. So thank you for that question. Great, thanks Dr. Jarvis. Uh, next up we have Eric Russell, Portland Press Herald. Thank you both for taking the time. I had a question about staffing today. I know that throughout the pandemic, staffing has been a concern at hospitals. Um, and I wondered with the um, increased amount of vaccinations, particularly with the um, uh, the mass site coming on board here uh, starting next week, if there are any challenges with, um, with staffing and how you're gonna manage that. I know you mentioned volunteers and that sort of thing, but there's gotta be some staffing concerns and worry about staff uh, at your various hospitals getting burnt out. Sure, thanks for the question. Staffing is always a concern when we're doing something more than usual. Uh, and certainly the pandemic has been uh, a lot more than usual. But the focus I think has been on uh, a very collaborative spirit among our workforce. Um, we've got retirees and, and others who are interested in, in supporting us who already have the training and skills and licensure necessary uh, to, uh, to perform uh, vaccination work. We've got uh, a, a very strong uh, amount of volunteerism uh, from our existing volunteer pool. Um, and those folks have already uh, surrounded a number of our uh, clinics. Um, and uh, uh, you know, we certainly expect uh, that they'll continue to do that based upon what they've told us. But we do know that we will need to staff up uh, in appropriate areas. 
um, to make sure that we're able to handle the, fo the volume of phone calls uh, that we're receiving that I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, as well as uh, the vaccine clinics themselves. Um, but we do expect uh, the existing uh, team and infrastructure um, to be the core, um, but we'll need to supplement that as we go. And, and what we need is a very scalable uh, model of, of workforce availability. So it's uh, some core uh, leaders and core uh, trainers to train those volunteers and new and newly hired uh, workers to come in uh, and work with us. But truly, uh, healthcare uh, has seen a very tight labor market uh, in, for the last several months. Um, and so we expect that to continue. So we need to learn to do uh, as much as possible with what we have uh, and, and reinforce and support those, those community members uh, that, that do become part of our workforce and volunteer throughout the clinics. Thank you. The other question I had, if I could, um, you know, it seems like a, a mass site in, in a, in a uh, population base like Bangor is going to be attracted to people in Bangor and greater Bangor, but there's certainly patients of yours, those 70 and older her and further out communities, more rural communities who might have challenges in getting to this mass site. How is um, Northern Light working with some of those populations that may, be, uh, may, have, may not be able to be five or 10 minutes away from this site? So it's a great question, and, and we share the concerns that, uh, especially in our more rural communities, and particularly with our, our more frail population, making sure that we are doing outreach in those communities. So what, and in parallel, while we build the, these large scale vaccination sites across the, the state, uh, we are working in other ways to reach out in other communities. So our home care and hospice agency here at Northern Light Health uh, <clears throat> has already been begun doing some of that, particularly uh, reaching out in, in our long-term care facilities, our assisted living facilities, and then um, in situations and, and areas where, where individuals over the age of 70 um, currently live. So we're working with that. We're also working with our partners. I spoke today with uh, Lori Dwyer, the president and CEO of Penobscot Community Health Centers today on a partnership that, that we're trying to develop between PCHC and Northern Light Health Eastern Maine Medical Center in order to reach some of, of communities as well um, as, as standing up this large scale clinic. And then of course, Northern Light has a, has a footprint across most of the state and our smaller hospitals have already been reaching out to those communities. They've been doing an excellent job. I'll give a shout out to A.R. Gould Hospital and in Inland Hospital as well as SVH um, who set up clinics so that they can reach the community. And we're seeing similar efforts in, in Blue Hill and Maine Coast down at Mercy, literally across our entire health system. Um, and the other health systems in the state are doing the exact same thing. So we will get to everyone. Unfortunately, again, it gets back to that limited supply. And right now we're focused on trying to get as much vaccine into as many people as soon as possible. And, uh, and that's really why the state is focusing in on large scale vaccine clinics right now. Uh, but we will continue to that out, outreach as we do those same clinics. Thank you both. Okay, uh, next up we have New Center, Maine, Chris Costa. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Dr. Jarvis, thanks for taking our questions today. Um, we learned yesterday about the uh, up and coming statewide registration system for vaccine. I was just wondering, do you know how the current Northern Light Health System will be incorporated into that? And I guess the second part of that question is, we've talked a lot with Northern Light, Maine Health, some of the other larger hospital systems about kind of the overwhelming call volume and interest. Have there been discussions with the state about how to avoid that when their system rolls out? So I'll answer the first question, the, the second question first. Uh, so we continue to talk with the state about communication plans. Um, I know that Dr. Shaw in his, in his uh, most recent press conference, you know, asked people not to call their primary care providers for assistance in getting vaccine because that's not the way the rollout and distribution are going at this particular time. And so that all that does is prevent uh, the phone calls for people who need to reach out for health care uh, related uh, concerns. Similarly, our hospitals are being overwhelmed uh, with phone calls and we need those phone lines open for people who need to reach out to us for emergencies or for scheduling their appointments and the like. Um, so that's the reason why we set up a call center for Northern Light Health and other health systems have done the same. Um, right now, uh, we are still working uh, behind the scenes with the state on what that platform will look like and whether it will integrate with our current system or whether we will have to use that system in total. Um, we just don't know the answers to that right now. And I am certainly not the one to answer those technical questions. That's why I'm very fortunate that we have a great team here at, at Northern Light Health to be able to provide those kind of services. So, so more to come on that. We have to be patient. Um, it will be several weeks away because the state is still negotiating out its contracts 
and then we would have to build a system that integrates with that. However, the state does have a very good website where you can go and find all the locations that are certified to be able to provide vaccine across the entire state. And again, at Northern Light Health, uh, you know, just like we're not seeing just Northern Light Health patients, we don't care if one of our patients feels that there's a location closer to them to get vaccine that's not a Northern Light location. We just want everybody to be vaccinated. That is what the entire state is into right now. Um, and together we will get there. It's just going to take time. Before we get to Charlie, it looks like we might have a couple of extra minutes at the end. If you have additional questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat and we'll get to as many different ones as we can. Um, and with that, uh, next up is Charlie, New Public Radio. As soon as you're unmuted, the floor is yours. Yeah, hi, uh, Dr. Jarvis and uh, Paul. Uh, as you may tell, this is uh, my first time appearing in one of these for Maine Public. It's nice to see you in a different, different setting, sort of. Um, well, welcome back, Charlie, yeah. and congratulations on your new role. Well, thank you, appreciate it. Um, can you, uh, I was wondering about the vaccination uptake among Northern Light employees. Uh, do you have um, the rates of like maybe across the system, for example, what percent of workers who qualify for vaccines have been taking them or, um, or, or maybe by individual hospitals, anything like that? Sure. So the, uh, the current declination rate that we have and, and by declination, it's people who've declined to be vaccinated at this time. Um, of, among our uh, healthcare workers is about 17%. Nationally, we're seeing 25 to 33% as the norm with healthcare workers. Um, so although that we always uh, wanna make sure we get everyone vaccinated who's able to receive vaccine, um, we know that uh, you know, we are uh, seeing a, a lower, much lower declination rate than they're seeing nationally. Um, and we also know that some employees have told us uh, because of scheduling and other, uh, other reasons, they, they are choosing not to be vaccinated today, but may uh, uh, be fully intending to be vaccinated later. So um, while we're pleased that we're uh, better than the norm, we always want to make sure that our employees are fully informed and educated um, regarding the efficacy of the vaccine um, and how it keeps them, their family members and our community safe. Okay. Uh, just so to follow up, um, I guess, well, one follow-up just to clarify. So you mean that presumably some of that 17 would then be eventually moving we, out of the declination category. And then, um, uh, so are, are you doing any kind of, um, I don't know, education or outreach that would, uh, you know, tell other people who for various reasons are declining to, to maybe change their minds? Yes, great question. We're, we're trying to make sure that everyone's fully informed and educated on the vaccine, uh, including our employees. Anyone who's eligible to receive it uh, is the focus um, of, our, uh, of our education efforts um, in particular. Um, and so we've, we've certainly communicated and continue to communicate with employees. And I think some people, what I've seen, at least anecdotally, uh, some people who were initially reticent uh, to receive the vaccine themselves are seeing their coworkers, family, friends uh, who are healthcare workers receive the vaccine, receive their second dose, um, and they're finding that generally uh, the uh, the health effects of uh, of the vaccine is much more mild than they may have read uh, earlier on in the media, and so there's there's a, a, a larger uptake of those folks who then uh, uh, do schedule themselves for vaccine um, following that uh, that new information. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, two more questions. Uh, first, we'll go back to Chris Costa, New Center, Maine. Go ahead, Chris. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to follow up on uh, this kind of this in-between time as people are still scheduling appointments through Northern Light. Is there uh, any guidance from the Northern Light system about uh, the way that, similar to what you guys have, have uh, suggested for the Cross Insurance Center? How early should people show up? What types of things should they bring with them? Should they be waiting in their car or in a line? And I know that every clinic is different, uh, but is there a general guidance that you guys can offer so that you know, people are uh, you know, aware before they show up? Yeah, so the general guidance for all of our clinics across Northern Light is, is to um, show up uh, 10 to 15 minutes before your appointment time and no sooner than that. Um, otherwise, uh, it, it makes the lines longer, um, can fill up our parking lots and the like. So really, again, like I said, if you have a scheduled appointment, there is vaccine for you. You don't have to worry about us running out. So it doesn't matter whether you're scheduled at 9 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. There is vaccine for you. 
Um, as far as coming to our sites, right now we are asking that people bring some form of identification with them. Unfortunately, just like I said, there was the scam issue uh, around social, people calling and asking for your social security number in order to get a vaccine. Um, we have unfortunately had people that have tried to uh, fool our system and, uh, and try to get the vaccine when it's not appropriate for them to get it at this time. And so uh, we, will, we will be asking for identification, so bringing that with you. Um, bringing any kind, the uh, confirmation email that you receive uh, if you've gone through our online process, those are helpful things for us. Um, another thing to remember is we have to give this vaccine in your arm and it is January, soon to be February here in Maine. And so we want people to dress in layers so they can stay warm if they have to stay outside. We're gonna try to limit that as much as possible, um, but be prepared to be able to, to get down to a point where we can reach your arm uh, so we can give you the vaccine. We've had some people who wore some very tight um, thermal underwear and uh, it became difficult to get those vaccines into arms that way. Make sure that your final layer is one uh, that has your arm exposed. So those are some great points. So thank you for bringing that out for us. All right, final question of the day comes from uh, Megan at WMTW. And this one is for you, Dr. Jarvis. She's wondering if you can talk about double masking and the effectiveness of wearing two masks at once. Yes, yeah, so that's a great question, and, and it's one that, that kind of, uh, for healthcare workers, makes us smile a little bit. If you remember very early on in the pandemic, people didn't want to wear masks and said it, helped, it caused them to have trouble breathing. And now here we are on the other side of the pandemic where people want to wear two masks. Um, so right now, there's not a whole lot of data to support one way or the other about wearing that extra layer of a mask. Um, I think really now that we um, have uh, medical grade masks uh, more readily available, that uh, healthcare workers are well protected from PPE. Um, there is that consideration of using a medical grade mask in addition to those cloth face coverings we've been imploring people to wear all the time. Very early on, one of the reasons why we didn't recommend masking and certainly didn't recommend using medical grade masks is because we needed those for our healthcare workers. We're in a different time now, our supply chains are better than they were back then, and right now it's secure. So if somebody wants to wear a second mask, particularly a medical grade mask over or under their cloth mask, uh, that, is, that is fine. It won't cause any problems and it may help protect you a little bit better. But right now, what I really want is everybody to wear a face covering, whether that's one or two, when they're out in public. I still see people who are not wearing face coverings, or if they are, they're wearing it below their nose, under their chin, on top of their head. It needs to cover your mouth and your nose while you're outside, while you're in, in uh, uh, any other building other than your own home. Um, in order to protect yourself and to protect others. So right now, I'm just asking people to wear one face covering. If you have the means to wear a second one, by all means, go ahead. All right, well, thanks all. Uh, that wraps up the media conference for today. Um, if you haven't let us know in the chat, um, please uh, send us a message if you want. The high quality video file, we'll get that out to you um, within a couple hours after the news conference. Um, and for the final word, we'll leave it with you, Dr. Jarvis. Again, I want to thank you all in the media for getting our message out. We know that things have been moving very fast over the last few weeks, and certainly for us at Northern Light Health, they've been moving very fast over the last few hours. Uh, we're grateful that you're partnering with us to get our message out, keep people safe together. We will get through this.